Good evening, those in the building and those joining us online and those listening uh, on St. Martin's Digital in weeks and years to come. It's uh, my delight to welcome you to the fourth and final of the St. Martin in the Fields Autumn Lectures for 2020. And the theme tonight is Trusting Scripture. I'm even more delighted to welcome tonight Paula Gooder. Paula is one of this country's best-known biblical scholars. She's taught in Oxford, in Birmingham. She's worked for the Diocese of Birmingham. She's worked for the Bible Society. She's currently Chancellor of St. Paul's Cathedral. The great thing about that job is nobody knows what the Chancellor of St. Paul's Cathedral does, and I don't suppose she's going to tell us tonight. But I'm glad to say she still finds time, she still finds time uh, to lead the field in terms of making the Bible accessible to people like you and me, and we're delighted that she's going to do exactly that uh, today. I think most of all I'm grateful to Paula, if I could speak a bit out of turn, uh, for making sure the, the Bible doesn't just belong to those who claim they have the only interpretation of it. The Bible belongs to the whole church, indeed to the whole world, all of God's people. And when I hear Paula talk, it reminds me that the Bible belongs to, to all of us who seek to come to know a God through Jesus Christ, uh, not just to those who claim it to be just for themselves. I'm uh, absolutely delighted to welcome Paula to join us tonight, Trusting Scripture. Thank you, and it's really lovely to be here with those of you who are here in the building and those of you who are watching online. The title, Trusting Scripture, is a rather intimidating one for a biblical scholar, and it's because it dangles in front of you a whole load of minefields if minefields dangle. I realize that's a bad metaphor, but you know what I mean. It places in your path a large range of minefields. And as I was preparing my talk for this evening, I became increasingly aware of where they are all placed and how complex it can be to get into it even before you begin. Because the title Trusting Scripture invites you if you're not very careful, to step on the minefield of talking about the authority of Scripture and what the authority of Scripture means. And if you know anything about biblical scholarship, you will know that immediately you begin to talk about the authority of Scripture, you can fall in one way or another into some very difficult territory. So I want to begin this evening by telling you what I'm not going to be talking about. And you will have guessed what I'm not going to be talking about is the authority of Scripture. And I'm especially not going to be discussing whether Scripture is deemed to be infallible or inerrant. If you know anything about these ter ter terms, you will know that some people claim that the highest form you can get into when you're exploring the authority of Scripture is claiming that you believe Scripture to be inerrant. There are others who claim that you can believe in infallibility of Scripture, which is slightly different from inerrancy, but lesser. Just to make it more complicated, there are also people who claim that the highest claim for the authority of Scripture is infallibility rather than inerrancy. At its heart, the discussion is all about whether Scripture has errors in it, whether it can have errors in it, and how you relate to all of that. So as I lay it out before you, you will, I'm sure, understand why it is I'm not going there. Um, it is a very complex area and will cause all sorts of trouble in conversation. Instead, what I want to talk to you about is why I trust Scripture and how I trust Scripture. What does Scripture mean for me? And for me, this is a really, really important area because it underpins absolutely everything about what I do professionally, 
as a biblical scholar, but who I am as a person of faith. And so I just want to reflect with you a little bit this evening on how we can begin to explore this area of trusting scripture without falling into the minefield of the complexities of discuss discussing the authority of scripture. And in order to be able to do it, however, we do need to ask ourselves the question of what we think scripture is. Why do we read it in the first place? For me, one of the really interesting things is that no matter who people are and where they come from in their Christian tradition, one of the things that they want to ask time and time and time again is, what does the Bible say about? If I had been paid a pound for every time I'd been asked to give a talk on the subject of what does the Bible have to say about, and then you fill in the gap at the end, I would be by now a relatively rich person. Not enormously so, but relatively so. Because we have that kind of inner urge, don't we, to say, well, the Bible must have an opinion on this subject or on that subject. So let's get somebody who knows what they're talking about to come in and talk to me about what the scripture has to say about. Um, and I'm not going to fill in any of those gaps. You can imagine it for yourself, what you want to have um, scripture have an answer for. The problem is that it's not that kind of a document. Um, it isn't even a document. And one of the reasons why we fall into traps when we're talking about trusting scripture is that we ask it the wrong questions and then we get cross with it when it doesn't give us the answers to the questions that we've asked it. What do I mean by that? The first thing that I mean by that is that the Bible is not a monochrome document. Um, in a way, we give ourselves a problem even before we begin. As many of you will know, actually in Greek, the term for the Bible is ta biblia, which means the books. We call it a thing when actually it is a multiplicity of things. It is a collection of books. And for me, one of the really interesting features about the books is that there are a number of voices speaking within the books. I will illustrate this a little bit later on in my talk. But for me, the fascinating um, feature of reading the Bible is that you hear different voices and you hear different voices that have different opinions about various things. So therefore, the Bible thinks nothing because actually the Bible is a collection of texts that has different voices speaking their own voices through in all sorts of different ways. And people who understand the inner workings of the Bible will tell you that actually it isn't possible to treat the Bible like it is a simple rule book, much as we would like to. I think for me one of the really striking things about the Bible is that people want it to be a rule book. They want to go to it and say, tell us what we ought to do about X. Tell me how I ought to live my life in the light of Y. And even the Jewish community, who still treat the Hebrew Bible as a rule book, will tell you that actually it is not a complete rule book. One of the fascinating features of Torah, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, is that actually it doesn't give you all the laws that you need in order to be able to live your life thoroughly according to the laws of the Hebrew Bible. So what has happened in the Jewish community is that post the writing of Torah, an additional set of laws grew up, which are known as halacha, or oral laws. And often what they did was they supplemented the original law in order to give you, in order to give you some more guidelines to help you understand how you live your life in a certain kind of way. So even those who treat the Bible as though it contains laws, would tell you that the Bible is not a monochrome law book, not something by which you can live your life extensively. You may or may not have come across um, a book which um, was one of my absolute favorites quite a few years ago, which is called The Year of Living Biblically. It's a glorious kind of slightly tongue-in-cheek account of a Jew in America who decided to live his life exactly according to the laws of the Hebrew Bible. 
And the reason why it's quite entertaining is um, he, he both reveals what is missing um, in the Torah in order to be able to live your life biblically, but also does it in a slightly entertaining way. So he asks questions like, um, he's sitting next to somebody on a park bench um, and knows them to be an adulterer. Is dropping a pebble on their shoe sufficient for stoning them, or should he do something more ex excessive than that? And my favourite bit in the book is uh, one day when he comes home, um, he's, he's clearly irritated his wife quite extensively. And um, it turns out that his wife is at that point menstruating. And according to the Levitical law codes, he cannot sit somewhere where his wife um, has sat herself. And so as he lowered himself into his favourite chair, his wife said, I've sat there. So he moved into another chair. I sat there and I sat there, and I sat there. Um, and effectively, she sat on every single horizontal surface in the house so that he couldn't sit down just to be really irritating. But what is glorious about the book is that it reveals the ways in which we treat scripture in an odd kind of way, as though we want it to be some kind of grand law book. And for me, one of the lovely things about that book, The Year of Living Biblically, is that out of it, the author says that he learned something really, really significant. And what he learned was how to be grateful. In inhabiting scripture, in treating it like it were a law book, what he learned was the spirit of gratitude, of being able to give thanks to God on a regular basis. And what that reveals to us in a really significant way is actually what the Bible does. And this is for me the really key bit of what I want to be talking to you about this evening is that the Bible isn't a rule book that tells us what we can and can't do. It's not a complete set of guidelines that allows us to say, if I do this and if I read this in the right kind of way, I will be able to live my life perfectly. What it is, is a collection of texts that change us, that affect us, that make us who we can be, that can transform our lives. And there's something in scripture which is for me, that absolute key, that scripture is a transformative text. So that begins to ask us the question, so how do we relate to the Bible if actually we believe it to be not a rule book or in fact an encyclopedia? One of the things I often observe about the way in which people engage with the Bible is they seem to treat it like an encyclopedia irritatingly ordered out of alphabetical order. So you've got to search your way through it in order to be able to find, if only they'd put A, B, C, we'd be much more successful in our reading of the Bible. But if we recognize it's not a rule book, and we recognize it's not an encyclopedia irritatingly out of order, it is instead something else. It requires us then to begin to ask ourselves the question, well, what is it? And how do we begin to describe our relationship? So what I've done this evening is thought of three half metaphors, they're not full metaphors, but three words that for me characterize my relationship with the Bible, which I hope will stimulate you to think about what your relationship with the Bible is. I'm not telling you this is how you should trust scripture, but I am telling you this is how I trust scripture, what it does for me, what my underpinnings are in my relationship with scripture. So the first word I have for you in reflecting on this whole question of trusting scripture is the word improvisation. This is very, very much not my idea, but it is a really great one, I think, for helping us relate to scripture better. It is an idea that emerges in various people's writings. The person who's probably most famously put it on the table for the most people is the New Testament scholar Tom Wright, who talks about this extensively. Um, actually, my version of improvisation is, is influenced by somebody else, but I will tell you about him in a moment. First, I will tell you about Tom's view of improvisation. So Tom presents the Bible as a five-act play. And the five acts of the play are creation, fall, the history of Israel, the story of Jesus, the life of the church, five acts. 
And he says, imagine that in fact we today are a troop of Shakespearean actors. And we are very, very good Shakespearean actors. So we know the whole work of Shakespeare off by heart. And if you know the whole work of Shakespeare off by heart, then when it comes to a certain play in which there are five acts and you start performing the play, but then you suddenly discover to your slight horror that the last bit of Act 5 is missing, what then do you do? Tom's answer is, as an experienced Shakespearean troupe, as people who know Shakespeare's work really well, as people who know that particular play really well, what you do when you get to the last part of the missing act is that you improvise, but you improvise faithfully. You improvise knowing what was in Shakespeare's writing already. You improvise knowing the kind of language that he would use. You improvise knowing the moral compass that would form you. And as you act on in the play, beyond the words that you have, what you are doing is improvising the rest of the story. What Tom Wright presents to us um, as his vision of scripture is that we, the church today, are like that Shakespearean troupe. And what we are called to do is to improvise the last act of the play. So the first um, part of the last act, the story of the church, is found in the New Testament in the book of Acts. But we, the church, are called to improvise the last bit. You can be faithful to the text because you can improvise in such a way as reflects everything that went in the text before. You can engage with the text properly because what you're doing is inhabiting it. It's a rather lovely image, I find, for what it means to be a Christian in the 21st century because it calls on us both to understand the scriptures really well. There's no way you can improvise well if you don't actually know the rest of the, the work. So it rather gives us um, a challenge to know our text as well as we possibly can. But what it also does, it calls into in us to be creative. It calls us to inhabit the text and to become people who live so much within the text that actually we can just live out our lives in the light of everything that we know about the text. Interestingly, Tom's original view has been tweaked by various people and I just want to tell you about the tweaking a little bit because it's the tweaking that I find actually really very helpful. There are some people who propose a six-act play rather than a five-act play. So for them the five-act play looks similar but there's a missing end of the of Act 5 and then the sixth act is the new heaven and the new earth, the story of Revelation, the end of all things. So they would say that that, that act is already, is also there. So the only bit that's missing is the bit between the end of Acts and um, the end of the world. Like I say, the only bit that's missing, it's kind of a big bit, but that's the only bit that's missing from your five act play, or six act play. Um, but the version that I like comes from somebody called Kevin Van Hooser, who has um, worked with uh, Tom's original view, but has changed it slightly in a way that I find personally really quite satisfying. Is he also has a five-act play, um, but his five acts are all marked by God's great intervention in the world. And he would trace them as a big moment of intervention and a moment of crisis and an in exchange with God following the moment of crisis. So he pulls the fall backwards into creation. So the first act for Kevin Van Hooser is creation and fall and the engagement of God with the world following the fall. His second act is the story of Israel, the crisis being, um, well, the whole of the story of Israel, but particularly the exile and the engagement with God following the exile. The third act is the story of Jesus, the crisis being Jesus' death and the resurrection. The fourth act is Pentecost, um, the crisis being how the church responds to Pentecost cost, and then the um, living out in the light of God, and again, 
for him, that bit, the end of the fourth act, is where we come in, where we improvise um, the final bit of the intervention of, the Pent of Pentecost. And then the fifth act is for him the new heaven and the new earth. In a way, it doesn't really matter which of those versions you go with. You get the idea either way. That what is important is knowing scripture really well understanding its beats and its moods and its character, and then improvising it out in your life. There's a mild problem with it, which we'll just acknowledge, and we might want to talk about it when we get into the questions. The mild problem of it implies that there is a right improvisation and a wrong improvisation. That actually, if you were not a very good Shakespearean troupe, who didn't know all your texts very well, then actually you might come along and say, well, that improvisation troupe isn't as good as my improvisation troupe. Not that that would ever happen in the life of the church, of course. But do you know what I mean? You get that kind of issue that there is right and wrong in the improvisation. And we might want to begin to reflect on whether there is a right and a wrong improvisation. But actually, it then begins to pull you down old-fashioned roots of who is right and who is wrong and how you engage with it. So improvisation is, for me, one of the key elements of trusting scripture and engaging well with how we engage with scripture. My second strand that I want to talk to you about is the strand of conversation. And for me, one of the really, really key features of engaging well with the Bible, of trusting the Bible to its full capacity, is understanding the significance of conversation. Often when we think about the Bible and when we engage with the Bible, we think of it largely as a monologue, um, which is that the Bible has something to say, I just have to find the right way to hear what the Bible is saying, and then it will um, affect me and off I will go. But actually, as I mentioned in my introduction to the talk this evening, that's not even how the Bible sets itself up. And for me, the really interesting thing is recognizing that scripture has within it multiple voices that talk to each other. Let me just give you a few examples so you know what I mean. If you have been praying morning prayer recently, you have been reading your way through 1 and 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Kings, um, which in the trade, um, the Old Testament scholars call the, the works of the Deuteronomistic historian. Um, doesn't sound very exciting, does it? Um, but the works of the Deuteronomistic historian are very, very interesting. Um, well... Maybe not right in the middle, very interesting, but as a whole, they're very interesting. Because what they do is they ask a fascinating question. Should Israel have a king or not? Was it a good idea for Israel to have a king or not? And what's fascinating as you read your way through 1 and 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Kings is you discover that there is not a single answer to that question. There are some people, um, some strands through the Deuteronomistic historian that says, yes, brilliant idea, because you get people like David, and you get people like Solomon, and you get people like Hezekiah, and then you get people like Josiah, great kings of Israel, brilliant idea to have a king. And then underneath that voice, you hear another voice, the voice that says, actually, they rather mucked it up, didn't they? They made a bit of a mess of Israel. And in fact, Samuel told them right at the start that it was a really bad idea to have a king and it would all go horribly wrong if they did. Um, and then there's another voice you hear kind of bubbling along saying, well, I told you it would go horribly wrong. Just look at that person and look at that person. Look how they messed the whole thing up. And you have these contrasting voices saying kingship is brilliant, kingship is awful. You even get Solomon was brilliant. He was the best, the wisest, and most courageous king, most wisdom-wise king ever, alongside the voice that says, 700 wives, 300 concubines, ripped the country apart after his death, wasn't such a great king. And you get both of those voices sitting contentedly next to each other in scripture. And then if you weren't confused enough about whether they ought to have had a king or not, in comes one and two chronicles who themselves have another view entirely about the nature of kingship, the way in which Israel is set up. 
And what fascinates me is that scripture contentedly has these voices sitting alongside each other, talking to each other, talking over each other, talking under each other, but conversing the whole time. Another example, think Gospels. One of the fascinating things as a New Testament scholar, as I am, um, is engaging with the Gospels. And one of the great kind of strands that runs through New Testament scholarship is trying to harmonize the Gospels, trying to get the Gospels to say the same thing about dates and about people and about locations. Where was Jesus when he did this? What, what um, date did that kind of thing happen? All of those issues kind of, kind of bubble around. And for me, the fascinating thing about the Gospels is that they are unashamedly different. It is almost impossible to put the Gospels together in a harmonious account. If you want to have a brain ache for an afternoon, try and work out precisely which day Jesus was crucified on. Um, it'll defeat you, I can guarantee it, unless you've got a particularly elastic mind. Um, because what happens in um, Matthew, Mark and Luke and in John is they're telling different versions of a story. At which point I can hear people saying, yes, but which was the right version of the story? To which I want to respond, well, both of them, because they're both in scripture. And then you have to ask yourself the question is why do they have one version of Jesus being, dying, being crucified on one day and another version of Jesus being crucified on another day? The answer is because they're conjuring with different forms of truth, with theological truth as well as historical truth, and they're placing them alongside each other. And for me, the really interesting thing is scripture, scripture just simply says, here you go. It doesn't try to reconcile it. It doesn't try to give you the right answer. It doesn't try to unpick anything. It simply says, here you are. Here's the conversation. Which brings me back to how I think scripture is inviting us to engage. Is that what scripture is saying is saying, here's the conversation. We'll set it up for you. Was it a good idea to have a king? on the one hand, on the other hand, on the third and fourth hand, let's lay it all out for you. Where, where are you? Where do you locate yourself in this conversation? Who do you think Jesus was? How do we understand how Jesus performed his ministry in Galilee? Well, there's this view and there's this view. How do you locate yourself in this? For me, one of the really important strands of engaging with scripture and engaging scripture well is joining the conversation and having the confidence to join the conversation in such a way that trusts scripture to be knowing what it's doing. I think for me, one of the things that we're often quite frightened about is that if we press scripture too hard in this direction or in that direction, it'll all fall apart and it will feel very unsafe. But actually, what if Scripture is all about conversation. It's all about exploring the territory of working out where you get to and how you get there. What if that's the point? And therefore, if we're squeezing it into having one single view, we hit all sorts of problems and we begin not only to misunderstand scripture, but actually not to trust it. So for me, trusting scripture involves an element of conversation, of joining in, of not trying to close things down too quickly. In fact, one of the things that um, I learned very early on um, in my life as a New Testament scholar was from Tom Wright, who was my tutor when I was an undergraduate. And um, there was one day when I was really, really wrestling with something and just couldn't work out what I was going to do with it. And he um, said, wait a minute. And he went into his back room um, and came out with a really fat notebook and he said to me, when I can't understand something about the Bible, I write it down in this book. And it was very, very reassuringly thick. Um, and occasionally, I'll come back, and he, I, he goes back to the notebook regularly. Uh, occasionally, I go back to the notebook and I realize that I've resolved something for myself. And occasionally, I go back to the notebook and realize it's still not resolved and in it sits for uh, many years to come. And it's been one of the most inspirational things that somebody has ever said to me. It's all right not to get it. 
It's all right not to understand it entirely. And it might be all right never to get it. And that might be part of the point, that actually engaging in the conversation will take you somewhere and will move you into a new way of being. Um, and it's a new way of being in which you may in fact realize that your original question wasn't the right question after all, that a better question was to ask this question or that question. So, improvisation, conversation. Um, and then I tried for a third one, and because I'd got two Asians, um, I was de determined to get a third one. So I've gone for exploration, when it's not quite right. Um, it's really going on an adventure with scripture. Um, um, and I was just trying to get three words that all ended in Asian, and I realized that was a bad idea in the end. But for me, allowing scripture to take you on an adventure is the third and most important strand of trusting scripture. Because what so often happens when we engage with scripture is we like to tell the Bible what it thinks. And we tell it what it thinks by asking it certain questions. If we ask it this question, then it will give me that answer, and therefore my world will stay entirely as I knew it to be in the first place. For me, the real advanced level reading the Bible is being prepared to be taken on a journey with Scripture um, to a place where you never imagined it was possible. I realize that one thing I forgot to say when I was talking about conversation, but this becomes relevant here, is that actually one element of trusting Scripture enough to have a conversation with it is having confidence to disagree sometimes and to say, actually, that's not my view. Um, one of the interesting things I think that happens then is occasionally your mind is changed and occasionally you have a different view. Um, and at other times, your mind is not changed and you remain disagreeing with certain points that you encounter and having the confidence to say that that is all right. So when I say there's something important about engaging with scripture which takes us on an adventure, I don't mean it will always prove to you that you were wrong in the first place. That's absolutely not what I mean. What I mean is that scripture, if you allow it to take on, um, on an adventure with you, so allow it to take you on an adventure, actually can simply reframe you completely, tell you an entirely different story, help you understand the world in a completely different way. I want to talk to you a little bit now about parables. Um, I've just finished a book called The Parables, and it absolutely opened my eyes in, I mean, I, I knew it would, but it blew my world apart in a way that I didn't quite expect. When we teach people how to read the Bible, those of us who are biblical scholars, we often do something that we call genre criticism. So we teach people about reading a book of the Bible according to what kind of genre it is. So the whole point is you will open a book and go, ah, clearly this is a psalm, it's a poem, therefore I will read it um, in this kind of a way. This is a piece of, piece of law, therefore I'll read it in that kind of a way. This is a piece of history. This is biography, like from the Gospels. This is an epistle. And kind of the basics of New Testament scholarship are you look at a particular book, you work out what kind of genre it is, and then you read it using that genre because it helps you understand it. It's nice and straightforward. Everyone loves it. Gives them a nice framework. Until you get the parables. The parables, in my view, throw everything we teach everybody about genre up into the air, and then they all come down in a completely different order. The thing I learned when I was writing my book on the parables is this. No one parable is like any other parable. So basically what happens when you're reading the parables is you have to start again every time you read a parable. Um, if you want to say something about the parables, you will always find a parable that it's not true of. Um, it is just something really frustrating. You'll come up with a rule and you'll say, all parables are, at which point you can feel a few parables at the back going, me, 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 I'm not like that. Um, I'm completely different. The really frustrating, um, exciting, um, kind of tantalizing thing about parables is that they all insist on being read on their own terms. 
Let me just explain a little bit what I mean by that. So there are some parables that, have, um, that are clearly allegories. They have a one-to-one -one correlation. And we know that because Jesus tells us. The best example of it is the parable of the sower. And what he, will, what he does there is he says, well, the, so, the seed that fall, falls on this ground is this, and the seed that falls on that ground is that, and the seed that falls on the other ground is the other. So he does you a nice, this equals that, this equals that, this equals that. So because Jesus does it in the parable of the sower, the really tempting thing is to go, well, that's how we interpret the parables, isn't it? And then you try and do it on another parable, and it just doesn't work. Um, take, for example, um, our desire to try and kind of neatly tidy things up. The parable of the wedding banquet, um, one of those ones that causes many people to put their heads down on the desk and cry, because you start well, um, there, whether, whether you're reading in Matthew or in Luke, um, you've either got a king or um, a, a landowner who invites people to a banquet. Clearly the king or landowner is God. Excellent. And then the people he invites to the banquet, they all, you all know the parable, I'm sure, they all come up with their excuses about why they can't come. So then he goes out to the highways and byways and drags people in. All nice and straightforward. We know what it's about, don't we? There's God, there's people who aren't grateful for God's invitation, and then there's the people who are grateful, nicely tied up. Until you get to the end of Matthew's Gospel, where in the middle of this whole nicely tied up, ordered parable, you discover some poor bloke who hasn't put the right clothes on for coming to the wedding banquet and gets chucked out because he's not wearing the right clothes. At which point you have to go, is that God? Has God really just chucked someone out for wearing the wrong clothes to a wedding banquet he didn't know he was going to in the first place? Um, at which point you then realize that the parable's playing with you, that actually you've just set things up in a nice ordered way, and it then pulls the rug out from under your feet. And time and time again, as we read the parables, what we realize is that the way I read it last time isn't the way I can read this one. And one of our biggest, biggest mistakes in reading the parables is insisting we have to find God and we have to find me in each one of the parables. If you try and do that, you will end up a cropper when you read the parables because you end up with all sorts of things that go wrong for you. Um, instead, what we have to do is to say, well, this parable is taking me on a journey in this direction. And this parable is taking me on a journey in that direction. Do you have to let it take you and see where you end up? And ask yourself at the end, did I see God there? Was God where I expected God to be? And was I there? Was I where I expected me to be? And often what I found happened with the parables is that God either would be not where I expected God to be, or would turn up in an unexpected place, or what I thought was a parable that was about me turned out to be nothing to do with me at all. Um, and I had to allow it just to take me and to learn the lesson um, about it. When I, my book came out, my parables book, book came out, I invited people to... Um, I was on Twitter, and I don't know if you know what a GIF is, but a GIF is a little animated picture. And I invited people to send me a GIF of, a, of something that most summed up a parable for them. The most common one I got back was not one that summed up a parable, but one that summed up the parables, all of them, which was somebody standing there saying, why don't you just say what you mean? I got about 10 of those back um, in my request. And clearly what many, many people think about the parables is that Jesus is just being an annoyingly um, kind of vague. He's not, uh, what he, he could tell them what he means and actually he's just decided not to. I think Jesus is deliberately not telling us what he means because he's saying, come on an adventure with me. Learn something about yourself you never knew before. Learn something about God you never knew before. Learn something about the world you never knew before. And actually, the next time you read this same parable, you'll probably have to do it again because it will shift and it will change. So for me, trusting scripture 
also involves going on an adventure, allowing it to pull you into places you never imagined. Um, and one of the dynamics of that, part of that which is, I think, really very significant, is one in which you are allowed to say, um, I don't agree with that. I, I haven't quite arrived in that place yet. I need to be in a different place, which is getting back to the conversation with Scripture, where we trust Scripture enough to say, I really struggle with this passage. I really hate, actually, my husband is here tonight, and he will tell you um, that he had to suffer through the Deuteronomistic historian um, in morning prayer, where I would come home and go, and another thing about the Deuteronomistic historian. He will nod and now and tell you that I did that most mornings. Can you believe what he did? Um, for me, one of the really significant things about the Deuteronomistic historian is I disagree with him so fundamentally in so very many ways, and yet he characterizes something about the relationship between God and Israel, which is powerful. And if we trust scripture enough, we can both powerfully disagree and also be transformed. So my three words for trusting scripture are improvisation, conversation, exploration, going on an adventure. Improvisation, knowing scripture well enough, having it deep in your bones so that actually you can inhabit it, respond to it creatively, and live out your life in the light of what scripture teaches you. Conversation, understanding that scripture actually presents to us a multiplicity of voices and simply says to us, there's just one voice missing. It's yours. Come join in. And the other element of that, which I'd just like to add um, at the end, is that the reason why conversation becomes really important is that we then need to find out who else's voices have not joined in with the conversation. Where the way in which script, the interpretation of scripture goes badly, badly wrong is when we read it in hermetically sealed bubbles in which we don't listen to certain voices. For me, the key to scripture is recognizing that it has started the conversation. We are invited to join in, but we're also invited to draw other people's voices in to make sure that the conversation is as big and expansive as possible. And then finally, we have to allow scripture to change us, to transform us, to take us to places we never dreamed that we would go. Sometimes that will be to places that actually change our minds about something significantly. Sometimes it's to places that we find um, ourselves emotionally satisfied in a way that we could never imagine. But allowing scripture to surprise us, to disrupt us, to throw things up in the air and see where we get to. And if we can do that, then actually you'll discover that scripture is a companion for life and you'll need to read it all the time because actually that trust in scripture will transform who you are, where you're going and how you understand the world. So trusting scripture is for me a bedrock of my faith as well as my scholarship. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, a simple, I'm going to ask a few questions while you generate your own, and then you'll have a chance to, to ask them. If you're online, then Ben will come and read out uh, a question if we get the opportunity. If you're in the building, there are, there are microphones on either side of us here. And uh, if you come and stand behind one, I won't miss you. Uh, but for the first 15 minutes or so, it's just the two of us. Did the people who wrote the Bible know they were writing the Bible? <laughs> no. Next. <laughs> well, it, of course not. I mean, and that's kind of, that's part of the point of Scripture, isn't it? Is that I don't think anybody, um, even Paul, thought that he was writing documents that we would still be reading. Um, if he did, I think he would have tidied them up quite a lot more than um, he did um, when he was writing them. So no, what people thought that they were doing was writing, um, I think there are 
I suppose in back into the kind of multiple voices, there are some who thought they were doing something more official than others. So, for example, the Deuteronomistic historian was giving um, an official response to the exile, why the exile had happened, um, though interestingly, incorporating a range of voices into that official response. So there are some who think they were doing something um, official. There were others who probably would have been immensely surprised that their text had ended up in scripture. Um, there are, you can find strands of those who are deliberately doing something significant. So Luke, I love, who in his opening to Luke's gospel, clearly declares that he doesn't think anyone else has done a good enough job yet in gospel writing, and therefore he's going to do a better job. So he, he evidently thought that he was writing something that people would read again and again. Um, so no, I don't think any of them knew that they were writing the Bible. I think number, a number of them thought they were writing official texts, um, and others were, would have been surprised to discover that they were writing official texts. And so if they, if they didn't know they were writing the Bible, where do you la locate, I know you said you weren't gonna talk about this, but <laughs> I don't think we're quite talking about what you didn't want to talk about. Where would you locate the moment of inspiration? Is, is it everywhere uh, and and also what what's the role of those who edited if one can use that word you see I for me um, the, the, the language of the inspiration of scripture has to be a maximum language rather than a minimum language um, and that means that therefore the Holy Spirit was involved at all different levels of the writing of scripture. So when people in, with oral tradition, when they started gathering the stories together and deciding to choose that one or not that one about Jesus, the Spirit was there. When they began to write it down in the earliest texts, then the Spirit was there. When they gathered them together and put that one and that one and that one together, then the Spirit was there. When they um, translated texts from languages into other languages, then the spirit was there um, when we read the scriptures together as the community of the church then the spirit is there and I think it's recognizing that the inspiration of the spirit goes all the way through um, the text right from the very beginning all the way through to us reading it together and was the spirit there when texts that people of other faiths regard as holy were written um, I think yes, but probably not in the same kind of a way. Um, for me, the thing about the inspiration of scripture is the recognition that um, the word, Jesus Christ, who became flesh, um, was true in a very particular way. This is where you get into these kind of whole questions about co competing truths. Um, and I'm, what I would want to say is that the inspiration of the Spirit, of course, is specially inspired scripture, the Bible, in our particular way. It doesn't mean that the, the Spirit was not there um, in other places, but that it was there in a very particular way in the writing of scripture. And so if, let's just imagine you had before you, a part, leave aside the wondrous and gorgeousness of those who you look out upon, not just your husband. Um, and imagine we had a, a whole church full of lapsed Buddhists. What, how would you then explain to them why the Bible was something they should take seriously rather than just another document from the ancient world? I would say that it is because of its subject area. So one of the key elements about the Bible and its importance is that about who it tells you about, God, Jesus, and the Spirit. I would say that it is because it has informed the life of the church for thousands of years um, and has both been prayed and studied for thousands of years. It therefore has um, importance um, and also because of the ways in which it's for informed culture. So it's about what it's about, 
um, and therefore it opens a window into something which for me is vitally important. It's about um, how it has been read and understood and explored through um, history and then also um, simply because it has shaped the culture of the West in all sorts of different ways. If you don't like explanation one and two, explanation three is a really important one. We can't understand Western culture unless we understand scripture and its impact on culture. And, and while um while you've really helpfully, with the notions of impro improvisation and conversation, exploration, you, you've helpfully, in a sense, enabled us to inhabit the scripture. W would you, and, uh, well, that, uh, you, you've done those things, but then when you responded to the question about uh, authoritative texts or texts regarded as authoritative in other faith traditions, you, you pointed to one particular notion, incarnation, as being uh, normative for the way we read the Bible, would you, uh, would you see, uh, that's a, clearly a theological notion, would you see a, a, a corresponding ethical notion uh, that might govern the way that the Bible should normally be read? Would there be a, a, a kind of a, a, either a guiding light or a, an outer parameter um, that, that should govern the way all, all people of faith should read, read the Bible? I think that's where I begin to become uncomfortable because that's pulling me back into the conversation I didn't want to have about authority and inerrancy and infallibility. Um, because I think that's where I want to say that there are multiple voices. And I think one of the things that we can do, um, and we need to be just very careful about it, is that um, we can so lay a lens over the Bible and say, the Bible will always say this. Um, and it always says this because we conveniently don't read the bits where it doesn't say this or it says the opposite of this. And in a way, I want to kind of hold us in a more uncomfortable place. Because what, in a way, what you're pressing me to say is um, there's, a, there's an argument in um, biblical scholarship and, and other areas which says that there's a golden thread that runs through scripture um, and you need to kind of trace the golden thread um, and it's always there. Um, the problem is it's always there except for when it isn't. And um, the except when it isn't bits are the bits where we get very uncomfortable and we tend not to notice the except for when it isn't bits because then we don't read them because they make us so uncomfortable. Um, and one of the analogies I often use is that we end up with a Bible that looks a little bit like a doily because we cut out the bits we don't like and we just leave the bits that we do like. And then we have a nice golden thread and then we feel nicely comfortable in our ethics of reading the Bible. And while I, of course, do have an ethics, which I suspect would be the same as yours, um, which would be informed by love and compassion and care for those on the outskirts, um, I do also have to acknowledge that there are parts of the Bible that don't play out that ethic. Um, and then what I need to do is go back to those parts that make me feel profoundly uncomfortable and say, well, what do I do here? How do I engage with this here? I don't think I'm living up to the highest standards of truth if I simply just read the nice bits and not the other bits, um, which is why I'm back to that conversation, is actually, w then you begin to have a conversation with scripture and say, well, but how can you say that when you can also say this? Um, and then that's when we need to kind of kick the conversation around a bit. And at, at the very end of your lecture, you referred to, it, coming back in your summary of conversation, you referred to uh, who needs to be part of that yeah. conversation mm -hmm. and, and, and the understanding, the sharing, the reception of scripture being something that needs to be done with a wide diversity mm -hmm. of, uh, of readers. Is it fair to say that the Bible was um, largely, almost entirely written by tiny minorities and uh, at least regionally, even if not within the, 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 their particular sphere of influence? I think we can say gender as well, can't we really? Since you're mentioning it, well, well, let's I, I, just but, acknowledge well, there aren't a lot of female biblical writers. There, there, I suppose well that, so that anticipates where I'm going, really. 
is, is uh, well, I'm sure you wouldn't say it's ever um, not legitimate for a person of a particular social location to um, pronounce authoritatively on the, on, on the interpretation of scripture, would it be fair to say that the burden of proof lies with those who experience social, political, economic privilege um, to, to explain why their interpretation uh, can be received by the whole church given that the whole church today is in the same social location that of the people that wrote the scripture. That's to say, largely made up of minorities, often oppressed minorities. It, it, for people who come from a privileged background and are writing within a place of privilege, is that almost uh, an impossible place from which truly to hear what the scripture is telling us? Possibly. Um, I think I probably wouldn't want to go quite as far as that. Um, I think the multiple ways in which we find ourselves privileged will always um, shadow our readings. Um, but I think it is possible um, with the right attention to the text, with the right attention to a different voices, to be able to hear others. I, I think I would be uncomfortable with saying that there is one bias in reading um, which um, is a lens through which you cannot truly see scripture, whereas there are other biases through which you can. Um, I think that you get into quite complex territory um, if you do that. Um, I think it's much more about being open to hearing other voices and particularly being open to hearing voices that make you uncomfortable. Um, and whoever we are, wherever we come from, whatever our bias is, um, hearing voices that make us uncomfortable is something that's crucial, including the voices in scripture that make us uncomfortable. Now, um, just wa warning you guys, you're about a five to 10 minute warning before you all rush forward with, with questions or uh, the equivalent online. Um, if you've had a pound for uh, if you've become rich, on, on, uh, as you described at the beginning of your lecture, um, I, I, I would say the two words that I've most often heard, um, I've never claimed a pound for either of them, I want to hasten to add, uh, about people's struggles with the Bible would be uh, number one, smiting, often located around the books of Joshua and Judges, but not unknown to the, to the Deuteronomic history that you've described. Nor um, indeed to Acts, we should probably say. Well, uh, well and, and then the second word would probably be gnashing, mm -hmm. uh, which is more of a New Testament mm -hmm. bad word, in terms of when people are sent downstairs, they go there in a hurry and they have a really bad time down there for a very long time, possibly forever. What, could you reflect or could you help people read those particular passages or put those particular passages in a, in, in, in a context that can help people enjoy and rejoice in the scripture that contains those kinds of passages? I think it would be very difficult to put a context around Joshua that did anything that other than make us feel really uncomfortable. And I think it would be wrong if we tried to, um, because if we started feeling comfortable, then we would end up with a particular form of nationalism, which would be, um, in my view, wrong. So I, wouldn't, I couldn't make you feel happy about Joshua. But I think what I could do is talk a little bit about um, the fact that scripture is always written out of and read into particular contexts. And what Joshua is trying to do is to explain something. And the really important thing about Joshua is to understand that what it's trying to explain is why they've lost the land. Um, I think it goes all the way to the exile, to the moment when they've left the land and they're looking back and they're saying, what a treasure we lost 
how did we lose it? And then basically what um, the Deuteronomistic historian does is it starts with Joshua. Um, some people would include judges, other people wouldn't. One or two Samuel, one and two kings, and says, and this is how you lost the treasure that you were given. Whether we agree with the story that they told about how they got it in the first place and then how they lost it, um, actually what they're doing is reflecting on their own responsibility. If you recognize that Joshua is about the responsibility that you have when you're given something important, that actually it kind of, the lens changes a little bit and feels different. But as I say, I don't think you should ever feel, not feel uncomfortable with Joshua. Um, and again, what you have to bear in mind with texts like Joshua is that they're, they're people telling a story about who they are and how they see the world. This is where I would get back to my thing about a conversation, um, is we are allowed to say, I don't like your view of the world. Um, that is a, a valuable part of the conversation. Um, the one about gnashing of teeth. Um, would require, in fact, a whole hour on its own. Because what I would need to point you to is um, what the words being used um, that are normally translated as hell, in my view, inaccurately, um, what they are, where they come from, what they're really trying to say. Um, actually, the short version is, I don't think that Jesus talks about hell in the way that the post-New Testament world thinks that he talked about hell. Um, he is both um, much less frightening in terms of the national of teeth because Gehenna, I would say, is not hell. Um, he is also more frightening because actually looking at someone in the wrong way gets you there rather than um, some of the more exaggerated crimes that we like to associate with people in hell. So it's both good news and bad news when you read um, the gnashing, the wailing and gnashing of teeth. But it, actually unpicking the tradition that lies behind it is quite a complex thing. So I'd need about an hour and so I think that's probably unwise to try and do that now. And you've, you've just referred there really helpfully to the exile um, as, in some ways, an organizing principle for how we can read the Old Testament. Uh, would you say there is a corresponding organizing principle for how we'd read the New Testament, that the New Testament, in a sense, if, if, the, if the Old Testament was at least compiled, if not originally composed, in response to the catastrophe of exile. Well, that's how, it, that, that's how we can see an organizing principle behind a great deal of it, not every single book. Um, would, would, you, would you see a similar uh, context that that the whole, that the New Testament was organized around, I mean, like the fall of Jerusalem or something like that. I'm gonna be really annoying now um, and say, I don't really go for the organizing principle um, of either old or new. Um, I think what you, again, what you've got are a range of voices. So you've got one strand, which is, um, what happens when you are in exile and how you make sense of that. You've got another strand of people who are contemplating returning from exile and what that particular means. You've got people who are um, fragments of text written from before the exile about how their understanding of the land affects. And that's what I mean about having the different voices. And I think the same is true of the New Testament. What you've got in the New Testament are a range of, if you want to have an, an organizing principle, it would be around how do we live our life in the light of who Jesus was. Um, but that's such a big organizing principle, it doesn't really do anything for you. Um, so it, the gospel writers do it by telling you stories about who Jesus was. Paul does it by talking about um, how the theology actually affects who you are and how you live as a person. Revelation does it by talking about what the vision of the end will be and how that makes a difference to how I live my life now. They all do it in a slightly different way. Um, so no, I'm not sure I would. I also have a slightly unorthodox view of some of the datings of the books, which would throw your question up in the air too. Okay. Um, okay, one last question from me, and then it's, uh, it's, it's over to all of you. Um, and this is a slightly self-referential question. Uh, that I, I think of you, Paula, as somebody who is really a theologian who specializes in biblical studies. But that's um, that ability to cross academic uh, boundaries is disappointingly rare. 
Um, I understand how universities work and, and, and how people become specialists, but, but why do you think the church has settled for this sense that someone can say, well, I'm a theologian, but I don't really know anything about scripture, or more commonly, I study the Bible, those are questions for others. How, how can one study the Bible and not want to address the kinds of questions that you've just uh, been addressing for, about hell, for example, which is clearly a theological question, but arises if you read any of the, well, not any, but many of the parables. Um, could you reflect on, I guess, your vocation as a, as a theologian who specializes in biblical studies, which I'm, I take to be your vocation, although you might want to obviously nuance that, it's yours, not mine, um, and, and, and how the church can more thoroughly embrace biblical studies and, 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 and theology, the conventional distinction, and, and overcome that distinction to the point where people would think that distinction was a strange thing? Um, it's a fascinating question, um, and, and, and very nice that I come across as a theologian who specializes in biblical studies, um, because sometimes I'm told by theologians that I'm not a real theologian, so it's very nice of always to have it recognized. It's the prerogative of theologians yes. to tell everybody else that they're <laughs> well, not they real theologians. Not. That's... that's most of the fun of it, I think. I think my answer to um, your question is that it, the way in which I read scripture and do theology emerged out of a frustration that I felt when I was studying theology, which always um, felt as though what people would do is that they would look at a text and they would break it down. And they would say, well, this bit is this, and this bit is this, and this bit is this. It's almost like they decided to make a cake. And they got out of the cupboard some flour and some butter and some eggs and some flavorings and some sugar. Um, and they put it out on the side and said, excellent, good job, well done us. And I would say, but you've not made a cake. Um, you've just put all the ingredients out. And so my frustration with the way in which biblical studies was often done um, was that um, people just got out the ingredients and then left it alone. If I may be rude about your area, um, what I often felt was that um, theologians would do is that they would make a cake without actually weighing out the ingredients in the first place. Um, and so they would just kind of mix it all around and go, da-da! Um, and I would say, yes, but where's it come from? What are the different ingredients? And for me, the real key thing is to have that conversation exactly that you're talking about, um, which is, from my area to yours and your area to mine that says, well, let's have a really good look at what the ingredients are, and then let's have a conversation about what the best cake to make out of the ingredients is. Um, because I think for me, the real question, and it's why I'm a Pauline scholar and not any other kind of scholar when it comes to the Bible, is that what Paul asks time and time and time again is what difference does it make? What difference, if I tell you this, what difference does it make in your life? And that for me is the thing that drives me. Um, but I suspect it drives you as well, but in a different kind of a way. Thank you. Um, well, that's quite enough for me. Um, this is your opportunity. I'm sure there's a way we should do this in terms of coming up the side aisles. Is that the right way we should do it? Or could we, are we allowed to come up the central aisle? Yeah, so come up the central aisle and then, and then go to your... So, F Phyllis, why don't you uh, kick us off? It looks like you're going to... Come, 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 come to this one. And Ben's lurking because I think he's got some, he's got some news from, from online, which could be quite extensive. So why don't you go first, Phyllis? And, and it looks like you've written a whole book to... Uh, <laughs> Well, I've been making notes because I thought it's really an excellent presentation. Um, so my question is, and maybe I'm just being naughty here, is I really struggle with the conversations in the Bible being so male-dominated. And so I would like some inspiration about how, how I can improvise um, for the Bible being inclusive of women's influence. Because this is one of the things that yeah. so often put people off about even looking at it. They will say, but where, you know, why are we left out? Um, it won't surprise you to know that I love your question entirely. Um, for me, 
the really crucial thing is we do have to recognize that the Bible was written at a time when may, may, men's voices were um, more widely heard, more widely articulate, um, more widely listened to in the first place. Um, although um, it is probably worth noting that it hasn't quite changed as much as we would like to claim that it has, but nevertheless, it was written into that context. And um, there are various ways of recognizing that and resisting it. I think the first thing, and for me, one of the things that I try and do on a regular basis, is we do need to recognize the women who are there. It is very easy to say it's just a male-dominated text. And one of the things that I've tried to do in my work is to say, yes, but have a look at Junia, Phoebe, Lydia, Lois, Euodia, Syntyche, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus. You know, you can go on and on and on. I could bore you with my long list of women. Um, but one of the things I think is really interesting is that we like to say that it's a male-dominated text and therefore there are no women. It is a male-dominated text and there are a surprising number of women. And because they are not celebrated very much, we actually diminish them rather than enhance them. Um, for me, one of my lifelong um, campaigns is actually to hear the voices of the women who are there. Um, their voices are small, they're not as large as um, many of the male voices. But I think the other thing I often want to say is that um, it is true that there are not very many women's voices heard in the New Testament, but there are also not very many voices heard from other men. Um, there are, if you count up the voices you hear speaking in the New Testament, it's a very small slice. Um, you've got a lot of Paul, you've got a, quite a lot of Peter, um, but if you think about various of other male characters within the New Testament, you know, you don't know what Epaphras thinks or what Timothy really thinks. So you, it's about kind of recognizing the voices that are there and amplifying the ones that are there would be the first thing that I would say. Um, and the second thing that I would say is that we also need to recognize that the diminishment of the voices that are there often comes from Christian tradition as much as it does from the original texts. And it is fascinating to trace the ways in which women's voices get smaller and smaller as you go through the Christian tradition, and then to resist that tendency. And then the third um, strand that I would say is that if the Bible is an invitation into conversation, that's how we insert female voices more into the conversation in the text, is that those of us who have female voices, we join the conversation. Um, and then you can both amplify the voices of the women who are in the text, we can disagree with the Christian tradition that has diminished the, Christ the women's voices over the centuries, and then we can join our voices, our own voices in. Um, and it doesn't fix everything, but it certainly starts to turn things around a little bit. Now, Ben, you bring news. <laughs> I bring news, yeah. Thank you, Paula and Sam. Um, Maybe got, give it, uh, have you got a few? Yeah, we have a few. Yeah, give us a couple to start with. and Don't forget to use the microphone. Sorry, there are over 250 people watching online okay, and engaging good. live. So, um, yeah, it's been really lively. Um, there's a couple of questions that are quite similar to each other. So Claire has said, which of the voices, uh, which of the voices are there that are missing in scripture? Um, and then Jay Edu mentions uh, scripture has multiple voices, but which one is the voice of God? Um, and Cherry asks, where would you start to help others engage with scripture from the beginning? Oh. Yeah, okay, that's lovely. a slightly different yes. question, isn't it? Yes. Uh, do well, you want to take the first two yes, together? Yes, the first two together. And then spend the rest of the evening yeah, yeah, on the last that's one. Right. <laughs> so the first two together, which are, which are the missing voices? Well, we talked already about one strand of missing voices, which are the female voices, which we need to amplify. Um, there are all sorts of other missing voices to do with um, background, to do with class, um, to do with um, Gentiles versus Jewish voices. There's a whole range of missing voices. And of course, there are missing voices through Christian history as well. And I think um, one, of the, one of the 
features of reading the Bible that I find most helpful is listening to people from very, very different cultures reading the Bible, because what you then have are different spotlights. So yes, there are missing voices in the text itself, but there's a lot of missing voices um, in the way in which we read the text. Let me just give you my favorite example of this, because I think it's absolutely fascinating. Someone called Mark Allen Powell um, read um, the, the parable of the prodigal son in three different locations, in America, in Tanzania, and in Russia. And in the three different locations, he said to the people, um, why did the prodigal son end up hungry? The Americans said, because he spent all his money and threw it away, so it was his fault. The people in Russia said, because there was a famine in the land and it wasn't his fault. The people in Tanzania said, because the people in the country that he'd went to didn't show him hospitality and look after him in his hour of need. Um, which is right? They're all right, it's all there in the text. But because we always read from one perspective, we even call it the prodigal son. So we're minded to say that it was all his fault. But we read it from a single perspective and therefore we get a single voice. So where are the missing voices? Actually, the missing voices are often in people reading the text with us and hearing the different perspectives. So I think that would be one thing I would say. Where is the voice of God was the other um, connected question there. Um, the voice of God can be heard in all sorts of different ways. And in a way, what I was trying to say in my talk is that we have to listen very, very carefully to the still, small voice of God. Sometimes you find it very, very clearly in the words that are there. Sometimes you find it very, very clearly in the words that are not there. Sometimes you find it in yourself as you react to the words that are there. Sometimes you find it in other people's responses to the texts. Um, and that's in a way which is looping back to where Sam and I were beginning our conversation around the inspiration of scripture. <laughs> the inspiration of scripture is that understanding that we will hear the voice of God, but you have to listen very carefully to hear it. And just assuming that you will always, one of the things that it's very tempting to assume, which is what I was talking about in my talk, was um, that if you could just produce a lovely formula that goes, if I do A followed by B plus C, then God speaks. Um, and it is really easy to assume that you can do that. Um, and especially when you're trained in biblical scholarship, we go, stand back and I'll show you how to do it. Um, but the whole point is that actually it doesn't work that way. It's that God speaks to us in all sorts of ways. I believe very, very profoundly that God speaks to me more often when I read scripture than when I do anything else. But it's not always in the same kind of way, with the same kind of tone, in the same kind of voice. And it's that kind of recognition. So, for example, when I read the Mark Allen Powell um, interpretations, I went, oh, I heard God speaking in a way that I'd never expected to hear. And it's that kind of thing. It's the recognition of God's voice in all sorts of different ways. Do you want me to do the third one as well? Or oh, shall yes. We? Go on. Yeah, that's... <laughs> so, how do you start reading the Bible in a way that doesn't send you bonkers? I'm reading the question as. Um, well, you don't start at the beginning is um, absolutely the rule, number one rule. Um, the biggest mistake, I think, um, unless you are actually, no, let me take that back. People are with different personalities and different um, backgrounds behind them. I do know some people who have very, very greatly profited from starting at Genesis and reading all the way through to Revelation. Um, I believe um, that for the right kind of person, it is absolutely the right thing to do. The problem with starting at Genesis is you're not very far from Leviticus. And Leviticus will normally trip most people up when they're trying to read it because it, it's advanced level Bible reading. So one of the things I often say is um, you need to try and read the Bible being gentle to yourself. So you ask yourself, what kind of thing do I find it easiest to read? It might be that legal texts are what you find easiest to read, in which case crack on and read Leviticus. But actually you might find yourself somebody who is much more inspired by poetry, someone who's much better with narrative, someone who likes a good little bit of a wrangle with Paul's letters. Um, ask yourself what you read most easily and start there and work outwards. 
Normally, I would suggest a gospel, um, but actually, I know various people who've really got into reading the Bible through reading the Psalms, because that speaks very powerfully in a way that other things don't. So read what you read most easily and start there. The other thing that I would recommend is that you read the Bible using a cross-reference Bible, which may sound an odd thing to do. But once you've got into a text, so for example, if you start reading Mark's gospel or Luke's gospel, um, one of the kind of the gospels that people would um, gravitate to, it's a really interesting thing to read it with a cross-reference Bible um, by your side. Because what you would then do is you would read the text and then every time it suggests to you that there's a reference to an Old Testament passage, you go and read the Old Testament passage and come back again. The reason why I suggest that is that the New Testament writers knew that you know your Old Testament off by heart and probably know it in Hebrew and Greek. So when they wrote their Gospels, they wrote knowing you know your Old Testament that well. The, pri the problem we have is we don't know our Old Testament like the people reading the Gospels first knew their Old Testament, and therefore we miss a whole load of stuff. Your cross-reference Bible is your easy way into knowing what the gospel writers thought you would have in your head when they said this phrase or that word or quoted that particular passage. So for me, one of the most fun ways of getting into the Bible is you start with something like Mark or Luke, um, and then you chase out all the cross-references um, all the way around the Bible, and you'll find yourself down some incredibly enjoyable rabbit holes, um, and that, I find, a really good way of reading the Bible. Thank you. Do, you. do you want to come and ask the next question? Do you pop your mask off and get behind the microphone? So first of all, thank you very much for the very good presentation. So I got, my, I got the, the following question. So essentially you introduce the concept of conversation. Then you introduce the concept of transformation and ultimately making impact. So I wonder, and probably it's my Roman Catholic background, trigger uh, some, some thought, it is, how uh, you position yourself with the Jesuit approach, in particular with a daily exam from Ignace of Loyola. Thank you. Thank you, great question. Um, perhaps you'd like to... Yes, I uh, repeat it. Repeat, so I was yeah, talking about conversation and transformation. And so the gentleman um, asked me how I locate myself within the Ignatian tradition, particularly the, the concept of the examine. Um, I am... Um, I have been, my prayer life has been transformed by regular use of the examine. There is something for me, the examine is at the end of the day, you ask yourself um, what has given me life and what has drained life. And over time you begin to discern um, where you are being called um, in your life. Um, that has um, absolutely inspired me all the way through my life. But I will make a little confession. Um, Ignatian reading of scripture where you inhabit the story, um, I've always found really, really difficult. And I found it really difficult because I'm a biblical scholar. And the minute I start trying to inhabit, um, I have a whole load of scholarly questions that start pinging off the sides of my head going, ah, but what Greek word is that? And um, I wonder what that socio-cultural um, attitude was about. And what's that historical? Um, and so one of the things that um, I, I wrestle with is engaging properly in Ignatian spirituality and Ignatian readings of scripture, where you enter the text and imagine yourself in the text. I also struggle because there's not enough women in my text and I want more, I want to be able to see more women in the text. But having said all of that, in a way, that's how I do my biblical scholarship. So although I don't do a proper Ignatian kind of sinking into the text, I do spend a lot of time imagining what it might have been like to have been there in the first century. And one of the books that I wrote recently called Phoebe was um, slightly an Ignatian reading of Romans where I said, well, what might it have been like to have been Phoebe who lived in the first century? And therefore, what impact might that have had on how she engaged with God and with Jesus and the early church? So although I am a very bad follower of Ignatius. I think that technique of studying scripture is absolutely fabulous um, and I recommend it highly to everybody else who will be better at it than I am. Thank you. Um, Martin, do you, do you want to... Uh, ben, you've got up your sleeve a couple more. Yeah, great. I 
was very drawn to your idea of um, conversation, bringing us in. It gives us a responsibility as well. I'm drawn to the improvisation and adventure as well. With the conversation, I was wondering about resolving things. And you said that Tom Wright had in his book, mm. oh, he wrote in bits that he didn't understand. Uh, it's a very appealing idea and it's a big book. And I just wondered how, and I like the idea uh, as well, the responsibilities with us to sort of listen to the different voices. You know, I'm interested, what does she say? What does he think? And so on. But how do we, do you have any guidance for us on how we can go about resolving that? Because if we're constantly just left with a conversation, it might lead us to feel detached from it. And how do we overcome that so that we don't just decide to stay detached, sit back, hear the different voices arguing out what they think, but actually to resolve it maybe for ourselves and how to engage with it? Um, brilliant question. Um, I'll let you know when I know the answer would be my first response. Um, I think that's why the question that I refer to when I was talking to Sam um, is for me really important. What difference does this make? Um, if I believe um, in that Jesus has risen from the dead, um, that Jesus died, um, died and rose again and um, is ascended into heaven, actually there may be a whole load of abstract intellectual questions I might like to ask about that, but the fundamental question is how now do I live? What difference does this make to my life? Um, and that for me is the way of resolving um, a lot of it. And interestingly, there can be a whole load of issues that are abstract and remain unresolved while you're cracking on and living out the difference that it makes in your life. Um, it, it, kind of pulls it down from abstract into concrete and that for me is kind of really the key to um, how you um, so in a way activism is the response to your question is you start living it out um, and then you are faced with the question of well what are you going to do now in this situation and then you bring your conversation back in and say well okay well, I've got this thing that I want to do or this thing that I'm trying to change or this difference I'm trying to make or what conversation partners do I need in here in order to be able to resolve it um, so therefore it is about it's about living it once you live it out then actually all the stuff that remains unresolved either becomes much much less important um, like precisely what Gehenna was becomes far less important than actually what am I going to do in the face of this terrible crushing poverty that I see all around me if that makes any sense it kind of it focuses the question down um, profoundly and for me it's a constant going back to saying I believe in the Jesus who died and rose again what difference does that make to how I'm going to do this what difference does that make to how I'm going to do that um, and it, it's a clarifying question I think Ben, give us a couple more, and then I think we're, 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 we're almost up to time. Uh, we have a question from Duncan. Um, I love the idea of engaging with the Bible through improvisation, conversation, and exploration. But sometimes when I try to do that, I find myself troubled by the question you didn't talk about. What is the authority of scripture? How should I stop myself being distracted by that question? <laughs> That is a great question um, and very nicely loops me right all the way back round to um, the beginning, doesn't it? Um, I'm going to be really, really unhelpful, I think, um, in that I think what I want to say in response to the how do I distract myself, stop myself being distracted by the question of what authority does the scripture have? Um, it just does have authority for me. Um, I don't want to pull it apart and say how it does. I don't want to define for you precisely what the nature of the authority is, um, how I weigh it against this authority or that authority. What I know is over many, many years of reading the Bible, um, professionally, 30 years of reading the Bible, the text that helps me work out who I am, the text that helps me give texture around my understanding of God, who works out who God is, the text that underpins my belief in Jesus' death and resurrection, the text that helps me understand who the Holy Spirit is, is the Bible. Um, and it grows in me, it transforms me, it has authority because it acts on me. And for me, that's enough. 
Um, I don't need to know the rest. Um, it makes a difference in my life. It changes who I am. It transforms the way I see the world, um, and that'll do. That seems to me an appropriate place to conclude the evening. Um, I'm going to remind those online and in the building that there is an opportunity to show your gratitude in a financial way. Uh, it'll probably be displayed on a panel online. Uh, there's also ways of texting uh, in the building and also ways of tapping a card uh, as you depart and those, you'll be made aware of those as you leave. Um, I, I want to thank uh, very much those who've put these evenings together tonight, of course, especially, but the whole series, Richard Carter, Martin Haig, the education team, um, our wonderful uh, camera people and audio visuals, <coughs> um, those who've supported uh, us in, in a, in, and enabled us to, to have these facilities to make this available, do go on St. Martin's Digital on the website if you'd like to uh, watch this again or commend it to others. Um, we now have these wonderful responses, particularly to uh, our pandemic situation where uh, remarkable things can happen and people can engage around the world, uh, even though it's so much harder to get, engage face-to-face uh, -face right now. Uh, so very many thanks. Thanks to our vergers, thanks to our stewards, thanks to, to all who've, uh, who've put these evenings together. I'm of course going to finish by thanking Paula. To me, the judge of a good lecture is, is two things. You, you want the lecturer to practice what she preaches. Uh, and tonight, uh, Paula has done the three things she commended to us. She has improvised uh, and she has conversed and she has explored. That's your first judge of a, of a great lecture. Uh, and the second judge of a great lecture is what does it make you go and do afterwards? Well, I think Paula tonight has inspired each of us in our, our own faithful improvisation in community. She's inspired each of us to converse with each other uh, and, and with the whole history of interpretation of scriptures and with other interpreters uh, around the world and in different social locations uh, to our own. And she's inspired each of us in what is, I would guess, for everyone here, for everyone watching in line, online, a lifetime of exploration. So you can't do better than embody what you're talking about and inspire others to do the same. Paul has done those two crucial things. Thank you for a wonderful lecture, a wonderful engagement with questions. It's fantastic to have you here. Thanks for the inspiration you give to the wider church.